Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes. Working jobs we hate, so we can buy shit we don't need. Hey everyone, it's Igor and Ryan here for Project Uproar. And today we have a very special guest that Ryan is just about to introduce. Yeah, so we have Donald Robertson here on Project Uproar. So Donald is a cognitive behavioral psychotherapist, trainer, and writer. He was born in Scotland and after living in England for many years, emigrated to Canada, which is great because that's where we're from, where he now lives. Donald has been researching stoicism and applying it in his work for 20 years. And he is one of the founding members of the not-for-profit organization, Modern Stoicism. So Donald, welcome to the program. Well, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for being on. Um, so we thought we'd start with like something pretty basic. We've been very into stoicism lately. And so cool. we thought a good question would be, how did you first get introduced to stoicism? Oh, good. Gosh, that's an easy one. Yeah, but it's a little bit of a long story. So I'll try and I'll give you the abbreviated version. Um, I wrote about this in my book, actually, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. There's mm -hmm. an introduction where I tell the story. Go. Both of those here. So you, uh, you maybe seen that. I... Um, when I was a kid and I grew up in Scotland, my father passed away when I was about 13 or 14 years old. And uh, my hometown, Ayr, is the birthplace of Robert Burns, the National Bard. And he was a master Freemason. Mm -hmm. And most of my friends' fathers were, were Freemasons as well. And so my father didn't really leave very much behind. My family were, were quite poor, really. Uh, and uh, he, he left behind his pipes and his cat and his wallet which had a little quote from the bible in it and his books on freemasonry and uh so i decided to read those and i couldn't understand them right it's pretty cryptic stuff there's mm -hmm. some hebrew and some uh mentions of greek philosophers and things like that in it and so i spoke to the local church minister about it and he got me learning a little bit of hebrew and i started to study uh christianity and read uh the bible and I read the apocryphal Christian texts, like the, the Naj Kamadi, Corpus of Gnostic Christian writings. And that's how I got into philosophy, because the early Christians were more influenced by philosophy. So here's a little bit of trivia for you. These Gnostic early Christian gospels that were found in Egypt, in Naj Kamadi, and read about the 1940s, I think, um, they found some buried books, like buried treasure. You know, it's amazing, this library of Christian texts. And, and they were bound, they're not as scrolls, but bound as actual books. And in those books, which were kind of like the Gnostics, this community's Bible, they actually had excerpts from Plato's Republic alongside the Christian Gospels. Mm -hmm. How weird is that? That blew my mind as a kid. I thought, wow, in a parallel universe, the Bible has Plato in it and Socrates, right? These guys were, their community was kind of suppressed or whatever, but their version of the Bible has got Plato in it. And the other uh, texts that they had were influenced by Neoplatonism. So I went to university and I studied philosophy and I was trying to reconcile my interests in psychotherapy or helping other people mm -hmm. psychologically and self-help and meditation, helping myself psychologically with interest in religion and philosophy and trying to find direction in life. And at the end of four years at Aberdeen, uh, I would, I'd learned a lot of stuff, but I was still just as confused. And I felt like it's like I was juggling three balls, like trying to get these things yeah. To, yeah. to knit together. And I thought, I'll go back and I'll read the Gnostics, go back to where I started. And I got a book by Pierre Hadot, an eminent mm. French scholar who's an expert on Plotinus, the, the main uh, Neoplatonist. Um, so I wanted to try and understand the philosophical influence on early Christianity and Gnosticism and it was a really good book so I read the rest of Hiddo's books and I realized he talked about Hellenistic philosophy in general. He was an expert on the use of meditation or spiritual exercises and early Christianity and early philosophy and the, the school of philosophy that had the most of these contemplative exercises was called Stoicism. And it was the one school that you don't really study in most undergraduate philosophy curricula mm -hmm. and so it was a bit of a revelation to me and i thought wow these guys are doing meditation and this is the basis of modern psychotherapy and they offer an entire philosophy of life and this that freemasonry had given my father an actual moral worldview and philosophy of life that's what i was really looking for and modern philosophy doesn't really try to do that but ancient philosophy did it's quite religious in a sense 
So I wanted a kind of secular philosophical alternative to Christianity. And the I suddenly realized, boom, the Stoics gave me that. And uh, I like to say, you know, if nothing else, it meant I suddenly realized I didn't have to read as many books because I'd been reading about existentialism and Freud Perfect. and Jung yeah. and, you know, all of this different stuff, trying to weave all this together. And I thought, now I just need to read the Stoics because they're giving me all of these things in, in one neat package. And that was over 20 years ago, about 25-ish years ago, I think. And I'm still interested in it and still talk about Stoicism and write about it all day, every day. So, you know, I guess I, I had that insight in it. It stayed mm-hmm. with me for the rest of my life so, so far. So 25 years down the road, are you a sage yet? No, I think I've still got a little bit of work to do on that. And, you know, one of the things I like about the Stoics is other schools of philosophy are often named after their founder, mm-hmm. like Pythagoreanism or Epicureanism. But the Stoics tried that initially. They were called Zenonians, mm-hmm. which I'm Doesn't glad they didn't stick the with. <laughs> Sounds kind of weird, right? Sounds like a, like Martians or something. Exactly, um, it does. It does. Yeah. But they abandoned that and said, no, we're not going to call it that because we don't believe, Zeno doesn't claim to be perfect. He's not a guru, the founder of Stoicism. And uh, so the Stoics were more like a, almost like a peer support type framework they had. They said, none of us is perfectly wise. They said the rare, the, the wise man, in fact, is as rare as the Ethiopian phoenix, they say, mm-hmm. which is born every 500 years. And they said, we don't, we, don't, we don't really know if we've ever found one, although we think Socrates might have come pretty close. He was their hero. So one of the things I like about it is it doesn't have this personality cult type thing. The, the Stoics admitted that they were all fallible. And the, the most that we can do is try and make some progress in life. Exactly. And it keep, that keeps us uh, more okay with our own process and the fact that we're not perfect as well. Sure. Just uh, a quick question, Donald, about Stoicism, the movement itself. So it seems like uh, it's made quite a comeback. You write about this in um, your book, Stoic Art of Happiness, uh, when it comes Mm -hmm. to the onset of cognitive behavioral therapy. But especially, I mean, if you go to a bookstore now, over the past just five years, you'll notice a lot of popular writers using the word Stoic Mm -hmm. or Stoicism in their title. Why do you think Stoicism has made the comeback it has today? Well, just as an aside, you know, this the, I, I became interested in stoicism before this happened. Mm. So it seems really weird to me because when I when I started off doing this, everyone thought it was the most obscure, nerdy thing ever. Yeah. And no one else was interested in it, right, except a bunch of academics. And in my wildest fantasies, I never dreamt that it would become trendy, right? That It seems, it seems really strange to me. Now in Toronto, I can go and get my hair cut. And the barber will say, what are you doing today, sir? And I'll say, oh, I'm writing a book. And he'll say, what's that about? And I'll say, it's about the Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius. And he'll say, oh, I've got a tattoo of one of his quotes. It's so weird. Like, but Stoicism is, is kind of having a, a moment. It's, it's definitely become popular. And particularly in Toronto, New York, uh, LA, London. But weirdly in Athens, the birthplace of Stoicism, Nobody's interested. Like, so it's kind of strange that it's become popular in these other places. So I'll say very briefly what people have told me over the years about the, the rising popularity of Stoicism. Many people tell me they're drawn to it because they see it, as I mentioned earlier, as a secular alternative to Christianity. So it's based on philosophical reasoning rather than faith or revelation or tradition. They see it as a Western alternative to Buddhism because it contains contemplative practices and a philosophy of life, but it, it's more familiar to people in terms of Western cultural values and norms and things. It's like academic philosophy, but it's more practical and down to earth. Again, one of the reasons that I was drawn to it. And people sometimes also say it's like cognitive behavioral therapy, but it's more philosophical. It's bigger in scope. CBT tends to be time limited and it's really remedial. It's about fixing problems. Whereas stoicism is similar, but it, it, it's permanent. It's an entire philosophy of life. So those are some of the things that people tell me about why they're particularly drawn to Stoicism at the moment. In terms of why this is happening now, I would point to two things. One, from my professional perspective, um, from the 1950s onwards, Stoicism obtained indirect validation through research on cognitive behavioral therapy. So if you go back in time, psychotherapists would have said, we don't really know if some of these stoic techniques are actually healthy. Like the Freud, this mm-hmm. seems like ancient. This seems like alchemy now, like ancient history. But for a long time, Freudians would have said, "Oh, you can't be doing that. You can't. Tr- you can't try and overcome your anxiety by thinking 
or rationally about it. You know, what you need to do is interpret your dreams and stuff. And like, you know, it's actually dangerous. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you might, you know, I'm not joking. Like these guys said, if you try and reason your way out of this, you'll just suppress your symptoms and you'll have symptom substitute substitution. So if you, you overcome your anxiety, you might end up compulsively masturbating <laughs> instead or something like that. You know, the, it seems bizarre now, but people said that really seriously up until quite recently, you know. Um, whereas now, cognitive behavioral therapy has swept the board and become the evidence-based psychological treatment of choice. And cognitive therapists can say, look, what we're doing is, is loosely based on stoicism, inspired by it. And yeah, the, the Stoics were basically right. You can use reason to, to deal with a lot of emotional problems. So now Stoicism has been freed up like, because we can say it, it, you know, it's consistent with, with the findings in, in modern psychology. That's one thing. I think the other thing that I guess the political reason, if you like, or the social cultural reason is that people tell me they feel bombarded by um, highly emotive social media and news content that's deliberately designed to press your buttons, right? You, mm -hmm. you turn on the news, they're, they're trying to freak you out, uh, to grab your attention, they're fighting over your attention. So at the moment I go on Twitter, what's trending, right? World War Three, <laughs> right? So they, yeah. that's what's on my computer, I'm beeping on my phone, it's World War Three. Um, today, what's it gonna be tomorrow, right? They, they're desperate to freak you out and get your attention. And it generally it's about stuff that's further and further. It's more global and beyond our direct control. It wasn't like this when I was a kid. We used to go and, and scrub for apples in the woods and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still had, yeah, my generation had a bit of a uh, growing up outside too. But I think the next generation uh -huh. just completely inside video games and stuff like that. Social yeah, media. we read the news. You, you know, I'd read that we'd read the newspaper once a week or something like that. You know, by the fireside on a Sunday or something. But most of the time, your kind of your world consisted in your immediate surroundings and your family and stuff like that. Now, as soon as you wake up, your phone is beeping you, telling you about World War Three. Like it's a whole different ball game. For and sure. and these people, these these computers and algorithms are just trying to freak you out. And so one of the reasons that people are drawn to stoicism that it helps them to avoid the extreme of nihilism and just getting up in the face of it, to, if, it gives people a, a way of remaining committed to ethical values and principles while avoiding being emotionally overwhelmed by global events that are beyond their direct control. That's a, another thing that people would say about why it's becoming increasingly popular. It gives us a way of coping with this mm -hmm. stress that we now face from social media and, and the news cycle. Definitely, so it's more relevant than ever before. That's very interesting. And um, I was also thinking about how, why do you think that is, you mentioned it, that it seems to be almost not given a fair shake, Stoicism within universities. And after that, could you tell us a bit about Stoic Week and your biggest findings from it? Oh, these are two of my favorite questions as well. Because I've thought about this and, and then I think the best way to put it when I was at university, if I'd said, why aren't we studying the Stoics? So I studied Aristotle and Plato at uni, mm -hmm. uh, among mod uh, alongside modern philosophy and stuff. And uh, they would say, well, the Stoics didn't really innovate in terms of philosophical theory. They took existing philosophical ideas from Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, and they focused more on developing the practical or psychological implications of them, which is fair enough, right? Um, and so academic philosophers are like, well, we just study Plato if we want to go to the theories and things. We, we, the, the Stoics just tell us how to apply that to daily life, really. Um, but that's precisely why everyone else is interested in Stoicism, because it shows you how to apply these concepts in practice in daily life. So the very thing mm -hmm. that makes it seem irrelevant like to academic philosophers, it's precisely what makes normal people like attracted to it. How weird is that? Yeah. And I think that, you know, the other thing is people have kind of forgotten about the Stoics and then what with social media. Um, I think of there as being a Stoic diaspora, right? There's people all over the world that read Marcus Aurelius, but they just don't hang out in the same bars, mm -hmm. right? So they, they don't they don't know why the, the guy that's sitting next to them in the bus also reads Marcus Aurelius. But social media is perfect for connecting those people and and so that's led to the growth of online communities right mm -hmm. um what is stoic week about i guess that's a good segue into modern stoicism 
So, I mean, I might as well tell you a little bit of an origin story. Like the, after I'd written some books about stoicism and stuff, I got an email from a guy, um, Patrick Usher, actually, who's a PhD student at the University of Exeter, a classic student in England. And his professor, Christopher Gill, who is Professor Emeritus of Ancient Thought at Exeter University, had been doing some work on Galen, Marcus Aurelius' physician and his writings, and trying to put those into practice for a week. And they'd heard a recording that I did of a stoic exercise called The View From Above that I put on the web, and they listened to it, the group of uh, graduate students. And they thought, maybe we've got a little bit of funding. We, we, we might do this project called Live Like Marcus Aurelius for a week. And they said, let's have a workshop, and we'll get a bunch of bloggers and authors, maybe like a dozen people or so, to come to Exeter and talk about it. And there's a video of that actual meeting. Interesting. That's the point. We all first came together, and Modern Stoicism Limited, the organization, the nonprofit, came out of that. So we created an online course called Stoic Week, um, so people could try a different uh, bunch of concepts and practices from Stoicism each day, we made it an online course. And uh, well, a few hundred people did it, I think, in the first year. And so a couple of years ago was our biggest. We had over 8,000 people around the world doing it. It got in all the British media, um, all the newspapers, it was in the radio and stuff. And then it started to spread around the world more. And we got in media and magazines and newspapers around the world. But I think there was like, for example, that every day there was a Mother Jones article today about Silicon Valley stoicism or whatever, just in my, in my inbox. There's a constant stream of, of media articles now. And like I say, that seems weird to me because when I started getting involved with this for the first five years or so, there wasn't anything like that. Like you, you, you wouldn't dream of opening a newspaper or magazine and reading a feature about stoicism. Mm -hmm. That would have blown my mind, like you know, to have thought that that was in the newspaper. Um, whereas now it's like an everyday thing. And uh, so it became bigger, and then we started having a conference every year, which is now called Stoicon. I've just come from a meeting earlier where we're organising Stoicon Toronto. Which okay. uh, will be, you know, later this year. We should definitely show um, up to that. Yes. Yeah, you guys should come along. Um, and uh, you know, like we usually have about four hundred people that come to that. So next, this year we think we can make it bigger. We'll maybe mm -hmm. shooting for five or six hundred people. And we do research to validate stoicism. You mentioned uh, the data that we gather. We have psychologists and statisticians that gather huge volumes of online data. Uh, first of all, from Stoic Week, although it's not really a controlled thing, it was more a public engagement exercise, but we got demographic data and stuff, and we got some outcome data. And then we designed a more carefully controlled, uh, more, more like you would expect to be in a protocol in a clinical trial, called, a course called Stoic Mindfulness and Resilience Training. Also, Stoic Week's too short. It's only a week. So we wanted something that was four weeks long, and that would give us more opportunity for actual psychological skills training and then to measure the outcomes of it. So it's still not a proper controlled study. It's what I would call a pilot study. It's a kind of preliminary data, mm -hmm. but we have more controlled data from that. And then the last time we ran it, we did uh, a another important methodological addition would be to do a follow-up at long term. So we did, that could be six months or a year or several years. We did a six-month follow-up um an initial longer term follow-up study and we got we got have data from that we also developed our own questionnaire which is important when you're doing this kind of research which has gone through i don't know how many revisions i think we're maybe a, i don't know what version we're on, at least the third version maybe it's up to the fourth or fifth version now of the stoic attitudes and behavior scale or sabs we call it mm -hmm. the questionnaire we use to measure people's use of stoic concepts and behaviors and we wanted to do that so we can kind of try and quantify how stoic someone is for want of a better way of putting <laughs> it and then we can measure other stuff like well how happy are they so does stoicism correlate with happiness for example like right out the gate and so there's, there's two types of research you can do outcome research where you try and change something or you can do correlational research where you just ask people two sets of questions and see you know what the level of correlation is between them um so that's that's the sort of data that we've been collecting, and and we try we use established measures that are used in cognitive therapy and psychotherapy studies or in positive psychology studies, so we can compare our findings against findings in, in other areas of psychology. It's still early days, but our initial findings are that after Stoic Week there was about a ten percent improvement um, across a bunch of different measures of mood and life satisfaction, 
which is not bad for mm. like a little taste course. And then we found uh, after uh, SMRT, the longer course, we got about a 30% improvement. Wow. And we've run these courses multiple times, and we, we also find very consistent findings. Um, so that is a substantial improvement, and it's also a dose effect. So like the more stoicism you do, the more we see the, an increase in the same typical changes. Um, and also the follow-up, you normally expect to be uh, to find a regression, like a re uh, some drop-off in the improvements at a six-month follow-up. That's normal. What really surprised our researchers was that there was an eligible reduction. So stoicism, I love this phrase, right? The holy grail of psychotherapy research is prevention rather mm -hmm. than cure. And to mm -hmm. do prevention, you need uh, changes and skills training to be, the, the problem with skills training is it tends to be temporary. So you teach people a bunch of skills, you come back a year, year later, they've probably forgotten a lot of them, right? So you, and then you have to do refresher courses all the time. And this is the problem that's been found with preventative training in mental health or what we call emotional resilience training. So it works, but you have to keep doing refreshers with people mm -hmm. every six months or every year. And uh, the early indications, though, and our big hope with stoicism is that, it's, uh, that stoicism is sticky, like, which is the term that psychologists use to say that when you train people in it, you don't have to keep retraining them in it constantly because it's more like a religion or way of life. You know, stoicism is for life. It's not just for Christmas, as we like to say. You know, people get it tattooed on them. They read the books every year. They, they carry on being stoic. And that's a big deal because it, it means it holds up potentially a lot more value as a preventative training. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I just had a quick question that I've been actually wondering about. And I was actually interestingly reading the meditations today where Marcus Aurelius talks about how we should understand we're not going to attain Plato's um, Republic, but taking those small steps every day towards justice. Um, how should a Stoic, going back to discussing the news and the uh, social media today, how should a Stoic handle more systematic or global issues? I'm thinking about things like we've read in the news uh, an abuse in power, let's say at someone's work, or thinking about global warming. And as a bit of an additional question, do you think a Stoic would ever be inclined to protest? Yeah, sure. Um, and Stoics did protest. Historically, they were kind of renowned for it. And they, if it, sometimes people say, oh, Stoics, they're a bit passive. You know, mm -hmm. they accept things. And that's, that's well, a myth that's come up a lot, yeah. The, historically, they were the opposite. I think one of the things, see, in a way, there's two angles in Stoicism, right? One is the angle that philosophers take. The other is the angle that historians might take. So if you look at the content of Stoic philosophy, you kind of get one perspective on things. You look at the the lives of historical Stoics, like Marcus Aurelius's career as emperor, then I guess it paints a different picture. Did he just stay at home, like sit on his hands and do nothing? No, he was a workaholic. Mm -hmm. Like you know, he was an incredibly conscientious emperor. Like you know, he did he did incredible things in his life legally um and, and and militarily like and politically like he was an incredibly active and determined and principled leader um not not at all a, a passive doormat type figure and this is the, the true of the other stoics um er, and early under the reign of earlier emperors the bad emperors like domitian and nero the, the stoics formed a group that's sometimes called the stoic opposition and these guys were executed and exiled for taking a principled political stand against political tyrants, such as the Emperor Nero. Um, they, these guys, they, these emperors, repeatedly had purges of Stoic philosophers and persecuted them because the, the Stoics were, were giving them so much pushback in the Senate. They would walk out of the Senate and protest, and, you know, like this was a, considered to be quite a subversive thing. So these guys risked their lives, and, and many of them died. They're sometimes even called Stoic martyrs because they, they were so determined to stand up to tyranny. And, and that's actually a big theme. If you read Epictetus... Uh, Marcus doesn't talk about it so much, although he does mention it briefly at the beginning of the meditations. He talks about the Stoic opposition and how he, he idolizes these guys. But in Epictetus, it's more obvious that he talks a lot about standing up to tyrants. And uh, so this is an important part of Stoicism. So how do we do this today? Well, what the Sto one of the basic principles of Stoicism, it's probably worth touching for your, your, your listeners on some of the kind of the basic principles, mm -hmm. 
So one of them is to distinguish more carefully between what's up to us and what isn't in life. So another way of putting that would be to make it clear in our minds um, what we're actually doing, our own voluntary actions, and then everything else you could describe as what merely happens to us. And so when we're facing these global issues, the Stoics want to be clear about what's our sphere of control and to take responsibility for doing what's within our control in a principled manner. So maybe, you know, trying to do things to contribute uh, to the environment or, uh, you know, to, to social justice or whatever your thing is, um, but maybe accepting that you have to do that in small steps and being unperturbed by the the, the fact that the, the outcome is beyond your di direct control. So maintaining your equanimity, not getting freaked out, not getting angry, for instance, or worked up about things, not, you know, being in accord with your principles, but nevertheless continuing to act in accord with your principles and being satisfied, as Marcus, as Marcus puts it very beautifully, it you know, with doing what's within your control, even if it's just, you know, moving your hands, moving your feet, you know, taking those steps, as long as you're moving in the right direction. But if you're constantly thwarted and things are going against you, you know, to, you know, be unfazed by that. Mm -hmm. And Cato is another example of someone who definitely constantly yeah. put themselves in difficult situations, which most people wouldn't even put themselves in. Definitely. Cato would be another really good example um, of somebody who, who basically died, uh, martyred himself, uh, opposing the tyrant, uh, uh, the genocidal war criminal, uh, mm -hmm. Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about how people precisely like uh, Stoicism because of the fact that it's practical, and that's what found. That's why I started like sticking with Stoicism because I used to read self development books for like every morning for like ten years. And I'd read, but then I wouldn't always apply stuff. So what I like about Stoicism and why I've decided to like focus more on Stoicism this year rather than trying out everything, right, is that there is these uh, practices that we can actually uh, put to use every day rather than forget about and have to refresh ourselves every two months or something. So I wanted to ask, what are the most successful um, practices you've found for people? Like, what do you think people respond to best among the stoic practices we have actual data on that from uh, from stoic week and smrt and the various questionnaires that we've done and um like one of the most popular stoic techniques is actually one the w one of the ones that, that led to the beginning of the movement actually um my first book on stoicism was a review of all the practical techniques mm -hmm. uh, it's a book called the philosophy of cognitive behavioral therapy it's just gone in its second edition actually i just but picked up a bunch of copies just now from my publisher and i tried to kind of list all the techniques and compare them to ones that are found in cognitive therapy and there was one that's very prominent in the ancient texts which baffled me because we don't really do something equivalent we don't do it commonly anyway in, in modern psychotherapy and Hadot called it the view from above so uh, i started teaching it to people and i made an audio recording and put it online and it was when they heard that audio recording that patrick usher and chris gill thought let's turn this into an online course, right? So the modern stoicism movement kind of began because I, I created an audio recording of this mm -hmm. technique. And so there are two things there that I'd say. Number one, my experience as a therapist is that, that people actually love audio recordings. Mm -hmm. um, as a therapist, I, I had happily talk all day to people about skills training and teach them stuff and give them handouts and things. But I know that the, the um, adherent compliance rate, we call it, with the, 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 the exercise, um, that I'm training people in is way higher. Like people are much more likely to actually do it if they just listen to a recording that guides mm -hmm. them through the process. That's a fact. So the ancient Stoics didn't have audio recordings, but we do now, and that that seems to help people a lot. That's a modern innovation that makes a big difference, especially with the more complex techniques such as the view from above. And the view from above itself is a concept and technique where you picture your life as if from a mountain top or from a helicopter view. Or really the principle is just to try and broaden your perspective, both in terms of time and space, and particularly imagine upsetting events within this wider context. That's a fascinating technique, and particularly modern psychological researchers love this technique because they see it's simple to do, and it clearly 
has a, 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 a very obvious and very simple psychological effect. So then it's easy to go, well, what are the consequences of training people on that? And the consequences seem to be very healthy. It's obviously inherently antagonistic to anxiety in particular. We know one of the most consistent findings is in research on anxiety is that when people are anxious, they narrow the scope of their attention. So the Stoics were way ahead of their time and realizing that if you do the opposite and broaden your perspective, that tends to have a, a healthy, a, a calming effect. So that, that's become a, a, a very popular technique and one that's particularly associated with Stoicism. Mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. Um, one other uh, technique or one other practice that you mentioned in your book, Stoicism and the Art of Happiness, is exercising restraint or um, another way, I guess, is vo uh, voluntary discomfort. So I'm curious, why is it important to exercise restraint in life? Or why would the Stoics say it's important? And um, how do you, if you are willing to share, how do you exercise restraint or engage in uh, involuntary discomfort? I know Massimo Pellucci, who wrote uh, the, a few Stoic books, he talks about how he fasts once a week. That's his idea of voluntary uh, restraint. So if you want to share that, that'd be uh, interesting as well. I don't normally talk about my lifestyle, actually. And mm -hmm. I, weirdly, I just never really thought of it. And in terms of uh, teaching stoicism, as it were, mm -hmm. um, most of the, the training that I do with people is more to do with the cognitive techniques for changing mm -hmm. emotions rather than these kind of behavioral routines that, that people are weirdly interested in. It's just it's not quite my main focus. I, I take cold showers every morning, which mm. in the summer is quite nice in Athens, but in the winter in, in Canada, particularly when I lived in Nova Scotia, it's a bit more of a challenge, right? Yeah, definitely. So I realize ice cold water. Um, so, I, but it, you know, like some people go, oh, I couldn't do that. Like, I, it's like having a coffee in the morning for me now. It's not, it doesn't even seem like a hardship, right? Mm -hmm. um, I fast quite a lot. Um, I was away when I was in Athens for six weeks. I, I eight every alternate day so i would fast eat fast eat mm -hmm. fast eat um alternate like uh, so fasting for 24 hours every mm -hmm. second day and uh, normally i fast for 24 hours two or three times a week um sometimes for two or three days um so i do i do, I do quite a lot of fasting and stuff and i uh, generally i eat the same thing every day like i normally eat dacos which is a greek Mm -hmm. Cretan uh, salad. Like again, it's this isn't really intentional, but it, it it's kind of kind of Stoic Spartan type sort of thing to eat. It's based on a a Cretan barley bread, which is similar to what the Spartans actually eat. But that's not a deliberate decision. I just like how it tastes. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> so I, I try to eat simple, cheap food. I don't even know how much it costs to make this mm -hmm. stuff, but it's really just tomatoes and bread and some olives, right? But it's it's pretty cheap and it's easy to prepare. And um, I live very uh, a fairly Spartan life. Again, it's not really that much of a deliberate thing, but I, I gave away or sold most of my possessions a few years ago. Um, and uh, the room that I'm in contains 99% of everything that I own. I've had some books wow. and storage. But wow. Pretty much everything I own fits in a couple of bags, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, like I, I, do, like I just stay in a temporary accommodation like i'm staying in a hostel at the moment just this in this one little room and uh so i i realized i didn't need a lot of stuff right so i, I unintentionally really in a way i just ended up living a, a fairly minimalist uh life it's I, I don't reflect on it that much to be honest i just something i've i found it quite natural to do um yeah my you know I, I, the fewer possessions I, I have the the better like so i try to to keep things pretty basic and uh your cold showers like uh you know uh eating simply uh fasting um you know stuff like that are, are things that a lot of stoics like to to practice it's interesting that um you brought up minimalism because i feel like minimalism is a lot like present already within stoicism but people kind of rebranded it in, in the form of minimalism, and it ended up being like super big deal, right? But stoicism kind of includes all the ideas within minimalism. Well, look, the, the basic idea in stoicism, let, let me explain this, right? I, I'll tell you the whole story, and I, hopefully it will take me like a minute or two. 
so really the arguments, as I mentioned earlier, the arguments that Stoicism is based upon are largely derived from Socrates. And uh, the best example, incidentally, is a, dial a Socratic dialogue written by Plato called the Euthydemus that everyone that's interested in Stoicism should probably be familiar mm -hmm. with. Because in it, uh, Socrates asks his interlocutor, what, what does good fortune consist in? And like all the good Socratic dialogues, this seems like a no-brainer question to the Athenians. They're like, this is the dumbest question ever, Socrates, right? Because the answer seems really obvious to us. Good fortune is being healthy, having a lot of money, having a bunch of friends, stuff like that. Like, you know, that, like, why do you even need me to kind of define this for you? It seems like a, a simple question. And then Socrates proceeds to make it into a much more complicated question. He pulls a rug under the other, uh, his interlocutor's feet and he makes it seem really like a much more puzzling thing. So, so he says, well, but hang on a minute. Like if, a, if an evil dictator has loads of money, is that a good thing? You know, surely money in itself is neither good nor bad. What matters is the use that you make of it. And it, it really, what you mean is it just gives you more opportunity to extend your, to exercise your will. But if you're a foolish and vicious person, it, it just, money just gives you more opportunity to be foolish and vicious, right? And whereas if you're a wise and good person, it maybe gives you more opportunity to be wise and good. So it's a means to an end. It's not inherently good. Mm -hmm. And that, that's true, actually, he goes on to say, of, of all of the other things that you mentioned. And, and then so the conclusion that he arrives at is that the only truly good thing is moral wisdom. And the only truly bad thing is is like uh, is vice or, or moral folly, and that everything else, all these external things, are merely opportunities or advantages, which could be either good or bad depending on the use that you make of them. And so, you know, that's his conclusion, which was really the philosophical basis of, of Stoicism. Um, and then, so the Stoics believe that virtue is the only true good, or arity, or moral moral wisdom is the only true good. That's the core of their philosophy, but the the main first corollary of that is that external things like health, wealth, and reputation, as we often uh, mm -hmm. sum them up, are, are neither good nor bad. They're what the Stoics call uh, a diaphoron. Uh, uh, they're indifferent things. And uh, a lot of these Stoic practices are about training ourselves to really embrace indifference towards indifferent things and to remind ourselves. And the reason we have to do that is because when we look around us from uh, when we're growing up as children, everyone else keeps banging on about how important these things are. Like, so you're a little kid growing up, trying to find your way in the world. You're just constantly surrounded by people telling you how important money is and how important you know it, it is to make a good impression on other people. And, and, and no one explains that these things are just a means to happiness and that they're not really constituents of happiness itself so because we look at people's external behavior uh you know we're inherently misled uh into adopting a superficial worldview and that's why throughout the ages everybody makes the same mistake and the stoic said we have to go through a conversion an epistrophe they call it a u-turn and go back inside and realize that the true good uh is, is something much more fundamental that resides within us and we shouldn't be misled by other people's actions and the things they say and get duped into this illusory worldview that, that treats external things, which are merely a means to an end, as if they're the goal of life, as if they, they have some kind of intrinsic value. Um, and it takes an effort and training to, to maintain that, that mindset, but really it's kind of a return to the, the source in a way. Um, it's it, the, the re, That realisation they thought is kind of latent within all of us if we just kind of dig deep enough and reflect on things for ourselves mm -hmm. yeah very good, very good um quick uh question so i have two of your books here we have stoicism and the art of happiness and then we have how to think like a roman emperor um so the first book i showed um I would say it's uh, similar to what you said before about your first book. It's kind of that broad uh, introduction to Stoicism, though extremely informative. Um, like a textbook kind of yes. set up. Your second book, though, is, takes a very different approach. And I'm curious to know, um, why did you use that approach? Basically trying to teach uh, some of the Stoic principles through the life of Marcus Aurelius. Well, I like that question as well, and you've given me a good introduction to it because 
Um, I was approached by a publisher and they said, oh, look, you've written some stuff on Stoicism. Like, how would you like... And Stoicism's now kind of trendy. There's books coming out about it all the time. How would you like to write another introduction to Stoicism? And I said, well, there's a problem with that, which is I've already written an introduction to Stoicism. And, that, and also, like you said, there are loads of other ones coming out all the time as well. So why would I want to just reinvent the wheel and do the same thing again, right? So the paradox is that's why they asked me to do it. Mm -hmm. but we can't just do the same thing again. So we have to do the same but different, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I said, well, how am I going to do a, an intro to Stoicism that, that is different from all the other intros to Stoicism and different from the other book that I wrote? Um, and my daughter, uh, I have a, an eight-year-old daughter called Poppy. She was probably about five at the time. And I, I used to tell her a lot of stories. And I, I didn't really know many stories. So I told her stories from Greek mythology that I knew. And I started to tell her then stories about Greek philosophers that I knew. And, and she was really into it. She was kind of obsessed with them. She really loves Diogenes the Cynic. She loves Hercules, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I, I thought, well, maybe why can't I just do this for adults? I thought, A, we might reach a different demographic, different style. And, and I thought, we need to get beyond our core audience and reach new people. And I thought, maybe we'll reach slightly younger people. Or maybe we'll reach people that are more interested in history if we focus more on the story. So we might reach out to a slightly different demographic, which would be cool. And I thought, it gives me, I mean, I can do an introduction to Stoicism and approach it from a different angle. So I'm not just doing the same thing all over again. And I thought, Telling stories is, is also more engaging and more compelling for many people. It, it, it's For a lot of people, it, it, it's a better way of teaching a subject. Then I thought, what would the ancient Stoics say? And I, I thought, well, actually, yes, the ancient Stoics would say the main way to learn philosophy is through role models um, rather than attending lectures or reading books. They, they knew that, and that's why the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius begins with a chapter that's written in a different style from all the rest of the chapters where he reflects on the virtues of 16 different members of his uh, household, his uh, family members and his teachers. Um, so he begins by saying, what can I learn from each of these, these individuals? The Stoics uh, said, you know, the, the, the reason they had a school is because they thought the main way to learn the philosophy was by following around a teacher all day and studying how he actually lives his life. And we don't really have that today, mm -hmm. but, you know, we, we, we just have to learn about uh, the character of, of role models. So I thought the, the Stokes would agree with me that this is a, a, a better way of approaching the subject. And, uh, and then there's another reason that I thought it would be valuable, which is that having had many, many, many debates with people uh, over the years about Stoicism in classroom setting and conferences, and now you know, we have the privilege of being able to argue with strangers online all day if we want, uh, <laughs> on Facebook and stuff. So like, having debated Stoicism a, a lot with people, um, I realized like, that there's a couple of common misconceptions about it. And, you know, like, and f the big frustration of being a philosopher is that nobody listens to us, right? So people say, these Stoics, they're unemotional. It's all about removing all of your emotions and being like Mr. Spock or a robot. And you can say, well, that's not really what the Stoic texts actually say. You know, they have the, this concept of propatheia and eupatheia. And like, so there, there are automatic emotions and there are good emotions. And it's not just about getting rid, rid of all emotions. Just, it's really about getting rid of the pathological or unhealthy ones. And so people by this point are just kind of yawning and ignoring everything you've said. And there's too many Greek words and stuff like that. So you don't win that many arguments that way, right? But if you point to, you go, well, look at this guy over here. Here's a Stoic I made earlier, right? And let's just wheel out an example of an actual Stoic. And you, let's look at Cato or Marcus Aurelius or Zeno like, or Seneca. Like, are, do, are these people kind of robots? You know, do they seem like they're completely unemotional? Particularly if you look at Marcus's private correspondence, which we have. It was discovered in the middle of the 19th century. A bunch of letters between Marcus and, and his rhetoric tutor, Marcus Cornelius Fronto. He's incredibly affectionate, much more so than would be normal today, actually. Um, he's very effusive in his affection towards his friends and family, Marcus. He almost writes love letters to his friends, right? It seems actually slightly odd from a modern perspective. In fact, some people have thought he would, uh, Frontal might have been Marcus's homosexual lover because he's so, he talks about his burning love for him all the time and his intense affection. And, and that's possible. But, you know, actually, the one objection that I'd raise to that is having told Fronto how much he craves him and loves him and has this burning desire for him. 
at one point he then says you know i in fact i you know i, I feel just as strongly towards you as i do towards my mum like which seems like an odd thing to mm-hmm. me to say to your sexual partner so i you know i actually i think it's more likely i love you as much as i love my mom <laughs> like i think what he's saying yeah. is that he he just is incredibly affectionate towards everybody mm-hmm. like and there are other reasons i i think that, that that's true um so he's not a robot he's not this is not mr spock Right, and so I realised that to address some of the most common misconceptions, it's actually easier if instead of getting bogged down in the, the texts, we we turn our attention a little bit more towards the a living of stoicism. And then the other objection we touched on earlier is this idea that Stoics are doormats and they're passive because of amor fati and the acceptance of one's fate. So people say Stoicism is about just accepting political tyranny and doing nothing. And as I mentioned earlier, if you go, well, here's a Stoic I made earlier, you know, here's Cato, Marcus Aurelius. Like, do you see them doing that? They're the opposite of what you're describing. It helps to refute that misconception in a different sort of way because people can see it's clearly absurd. And, and that's a quicker way of disproving that misinterpretation of stoicism sometimes with many people than it would be to try and argue with them about the theory. Then if we want, we can follow up by arguing about the theory and saying the, the reason that these guys oppose political tyranny is because of their philosophical beliefs. Mm-hmm. The last chapter was very interesting where, if I'm not wrong, you kind of took on the persona of Marcus Aurelius and then kind of spoke as if he would speak about death in your own words and then give him the kind of his own words later on. I'll tell you something odd about that. So I was, when I was writing this book, I thought, well, we'll go through it chronologically in terms of his life story. And I thought the, the part of his life story I find most interesting is his education. Because mm-hmm. in a nerdy sort of way, I want to know what, what he's basing this on and who the guys were that influenced him. But it's not a, like a training montage isn't normally how you start a kind of a screenplay or a story or whatever. Like it's uh, that you that would come later. It's a, a kind of not really a, a very attention grabbing way to open a story. So I thought, okay, this is a, this is broken. It's a problem. I need to start somewhere else. So I thought, well, what if we go to the opposite extreme and start with the guy dying? That's pretty dramatic. Um, and then we can like have flashbacks, or we can go back in time and tell the story of his life and go with the montage sort of thing. And and so I wrote the book in that format. And then I got to the end of it, and I thought, oh, now I've got a problem, like because he's already dead. <laughs> Like, so he can't die again. Like, and then so what, then we have the second Markomannic War, about which we know very little, and, and things kind of fizzle out a bit, really, uh, following the Civil War. So, like, you know, well, how am I going to end this book? And uh, I didn't have a plan until I got there. And then I, I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back and retell the story of his death. But I'm going to have to do it in a completely different voice and a, from a different perspective. Otherwise, I'll just be repeating myself. So I thought, well, what if I did a first-person perspective? That's going to be interesting for people listening to the audio book. And uh, it'll be like a guided meditation almost. And so that's what I did. And uh, I mainly, that chapter is composed of paraphrases of uh, Marcus's meditations um, that I spent a lot of time organizing thematically and also went back and consulted the original Greek, and multiple translations of it. You know, so sometimes people might not actually recognize some of the things, but they're they're based on uh, the meditations and maybe a, a slightly different translation of the, the original Greek and or bringing together quotations that are spread out through the book and uh, organizing them uh, together. So uh, that's most people's favorite part of the book, I think, mm-hmm. is the, the last chapter. Yeah, I liked it a lot. It really um, kind of calmed you about the fear of death. Obviously, you know, that's the ultimate test. So can't really say i i've dealt with it yet but um it seems like it would really help those kinds of thoughts on your deathbed Mm -hmm. i have uh, another uh, interesting kind of question igor and i will be um talking to a group of teachers college students Mm -hmm. uh, and about a week or two we've been invited to talk about um handling student stress um we're gonna probably uh, talk about stoicism as well i don't know if we're gonna use the actual terms uh that are ingrained within Stoic philosophy, but we're going to talk, we're going to definitely use some of the practices. Um, what advice would you give to, say, a university student who is uncertain about their future, maybe approaching the latter years of um, their undergrad or grad school? 
Um, what would a stoic student, uh, how would a stoic student behave in that situation? Mm. I mean, I think I'd give them stoicism. Sometimes people say, why is stoicism a kind of perennial philosophy that people keep coming back to? And one of the, the reasons for that is that it, it, it focuses on very fundamental and generic principles, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the idea that it's helpful to distinguish between what's up to us and what isn't was relevant in ancient Greece, equally relevant in the Roman Empire, and it's still relevant today because it's abstract and it's generic. So some of the advice that I would give people in that situation would be general purpose, stoic advice, right? It was how their own opinions and beliefs might be shaping their desires and emotions. And we call this cognitive distancing to separate our value judgments from external events. And to, to, to realize that when someone seems like an asshole, it's because you're imposing that value judgment on them and the external things are intrinsically neither good nor bad. Uh, just taking ownership for your value judgments and also to broaden your perspective and the, and the view from above or, or just in a more kind of naturalistic way you know to 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 generally think about things chronologically and spatially and from a slightly wider perspective is that those are all tips that i would give people uh, who are students and thinking about the, the future um, and also the stoic idea of virtue, I think, is of general importance. So asking themselves what sort of person they want to be. When we're at university, we get quite caught up in the outcome, the job we're going to get. Meanwhile, like life is going on, right? And uh, there's a risk modern psychologists identify in becoming too future focused, you know, thinking about what's going to happen when you graduate and ignoring what's happening right now in the present moment. You know, you might get hit by a bus tomorrow, right? Like, you know, graduate. Like your life, in a sense, is suspended while you kind of prepare for something that's going to happen one day, you know? Right? Maybe you get hit. The Stoics want to say, no, we need to value each moment as it happens. So we work towards goals, but we can't let the present moment slip away from us either. So even the day before your final exams, like you should also be smelling the roses mm. like and enjoying the present moment and 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 one way of doing that for the stoics is to think about the sort of person that you want to be uh and you know being aware of you know like to what extent you you're acting in accord with your true authentic values in mm. life and those values might consist in, in working conscientiously towards passing an exam or getting a career um, you, but you need to stop to take some pride, for want of a better way of putting it, in, in the work that you're doing from moment to moment in order to have ongoing life satisfaction and not put too much investment uh, out in the future. You, you need to get some satisfaction from moment to moment to be psychologically healthy as well. Mm -hmm. And the way that we identify those values, this is another topic in a sense, is, but we've touched on it already. You know, how do you how do you know what the, the values are that you want to embody in life and and Partly that's through philosophical reflection for Stoics, but partly it's by asking yourself the very simple question, which is what sort of people do you admire? Like, who are the people that you look up to? You know, or if, as Socrates says, if you were looking um, to, to have the ideal friend or the ideal boss um, or the ideal partner, what sort of person would you want them to be? Like, or what would you want your kids to be like, you know, in an ideal world? Like, how would you like them to grow up? And then turning it around and saying, well, what, how many of those qualities do you actually embody yourself? Hmm. There's a great Socratic dialogue where a young guy comes up to him and says, Socrates, I want you to introduce me to people in Athenian society. And, uh, you know, Socrates says, yeah, what's the ideal person that you'd like to become friends with? And Critobulus, his friend's son, describes the qualities of people he's looking for. And Socrates basically flips it around and says, well, how many of those qualities do you actually possess yourself? And, and, you know, aren't you kind of like looking in the wrong direction? You're looking too much over there. You need to epistrophe, turn around and look at yourself mm -hmm. like, and start working on yourself. And then finding these friends is going to be a piece of cake after that, right? Like, he says you should be as you wish to appear. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so actually become 
generous and wise and just if, if, if those are the qualities you're looking for in another person or the qualities you want to project to other people that your priority should be to actually possess them in reality rather than you know uh, trading on them in life and uh, I would that's the advice I would give to students don't don't let the don't let society uh, other people dupe you like into investing all of your hopes and all of your uh, attention on the in the hypothetical realm of the the future on after graduation and your future career and stuff like that that stuff's important you work towards it but don't lose sight of the here and now because that's where life actually takes place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's yeah that was really some great thoughts there um i also wanted to uh, ask you about books i know you mentioned books in some of your own uh writing but what books would you have most impacted your life and you would you recommend to someone seeking uh, happiness, meaning in life? The, there are lots of books that I would recommend to people that are maybe introductions to stoicism and stuff. But they, you know, that's different from saying what are the ones that really affected you personally mm -hmm. the most. Uh, the ones that had the biggest impact on me were Pierre Hadot's books. Mm -hmm. For, you know, I thought they were really well written and enjoyable. And I'd never read anything that described ancient philosophy as a bunch of psychological or meditative exercises. That was a big big revelation to me and one of Hado's books is called philosophy as a way of life and the the, the very title of it came as a, a an epiphany to me i thought philosophy is a way of life <laughs> you know is it like and he, he's got another book called what is ancient philosophy the inner citadel he focuses more specifically on marcus aurelius and stoicism um and you know those books like uh probably affected me i've read a lot of, of books over the years for my work and you know and most of them are really boring <laughs> like you know like i remember in the library at Abertine university like sort of literally i all my eyes are like trying to read husserl's books on phenomenology which are notoriously dry and boring right like really full like i was like oh, i've read this page 10 times and i still keep glazing over right but they then i read a lot of interesting stuff like heidegger and wittgenstein and things and i've read endless self-help books over the years because they used to teach people about them and a lot of self-help literature contains the same advice. Mm. There's usually little interesting twists on it and stuff. But the, the books that affected me most are the, the Stoic book, The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. I was like, wow, like, this kind of blew me away. Epictetus, I was like, there's something about this guy. It's so kind of blunt and 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 like he's straight to the point. And you know, I've not read something like this before. Seneca, maybe second to that, not quite as much, but a, a, a surprisingly contemporary. And then had those books, and those would, those would be the main things that I think really shook me and stayed with me, and and actually changed my life. Mm -hmm. And then there's thousands of other books that I've kind of taken little influences from, but nothing really that that penetrated my psyche to the same extent that the, those books did. You know, I read Freud and Jung and all that kind of stuff, and there were bits of it that I, I maybe still mention. Um, you know, but I Freud can hold a cat handled to Marcus Aurelius in my view mm -hmm. uh, in terms of his ability to actually change people's lives very cool yeah I mean I think the last question we have is um, what projects are you working on now or what's in the plan for the future for you today I was organizing Stoicon um, as I mentioned earlier so that that's a so this is a non-profit thing I volunteer um, we have a, a team team of volunteers, a multidisciplinary team that, that formed the Modern Stoicism organization. So a lot, a lot of my time is taken over doing voluntary work for the, the, the Modern Stoicism movement. And, uh, and I'm also working on a book, which to my frustration, uh, it takes a long time. So books normally take about a year to write. Well, that's what the publishing industry assumed, right? Um, but I'm doing a graphic novel, which is probably going to take more than two years. So uh, I'm, I'm doing a graphic novel about the life and philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. And so taking, it's a very different ball game to put it in visual form. And it's very interesting to do that. It kind of really changes my perception of some, it's amazing how much it changes your perception of things when it goes from just reading it in paper to actually seeing it pictorially. Um, and it's, it's made, it's given me some more insights into Marcus's life and maybe why he did things that he did and, and said things that he, he did and why some of the things that were happening around him. So that's the, the main thing that uh, I'm working on. 
Um, and I'll be still doing that if you come back and speak to me a year from now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm actually going to be, be an uncle um, in about two months. My brother is going to have mm -hmm. a kid. So, yeah, that'll be interesting. To, I could get him that graphic novel and I can uh, look for ways to get him to become a stoic at an early age. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks, uh, Donald, for taking the time to uh, speak to us. I think, I mean, we're great uh, fans of your work, and we've taken a lot um, from your work, and uh, we hope you continue doing what you're doing. And um, hopefully we'll see you at one of the StoicCons. For sure. Yeah, Yeah, you should come to StoicCon, definitely. What's the, what's the date? We haven't confirmed it yet, uh -huh. but it will be a Saturday and Sunday at the end of September or the start of October. Okay. Yeah, we're Niagara October. Falls, so we're really close. So there's no right. awesome. Yeah. yeah, like you definitely come along then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to get a couple of guys to dress up as Roman centurions this year and stand outside the venue. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so there some of these go. guys that do reenactments or something. Yeah, it's gonna I be interesting to see cool. if anybody wears <laughs> cosplay comes with like togas and stuff yeah. like that. Let's do, yeah. I think we should definitely do stoic cosplay in Toronto. <laughs> like that would make it a bit more contemporary <laughs> and interesting. Nice. But anyway, like, th thank you very much for having me along, and I do like I've enjoyed your questions uh, and uh, the conversation has uh, has been has been fun. Yeah, and uh, you know, good luck with your your listeners and your your podcast for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers.